Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. You could do better than that. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Now they heard you and the neighbors. That's good. We'll raise the roof. Isn't it good to be here today? What is on your mind today to do for Yahweh? For Yahweh. Come on, lift your hands, talk, shout it out. Praise him and do what else? Hear his word. Hear his word. Do what else? Fellowship. Huh? Fellowship. Fellowship. Do what else? Wait upon, Wait upon him. And do what else? Yeah. Amen. How about serve one another? Amen. Amen. We need to serve one another. So it's good to have you today. How about if you go ahead and get up and say hi to someone? Okay, maybe we could uh, kind, of, kind of come together again. <laughs> and maybe we could have some men come forward and hold the tleet for the blessing of the children.
let's lift his name on high. Lord of eternity, mystery behind the veil, Lord of the heaven and earth, God of Israel, come with your wisdom and power, clothed in your honor. Yeah. 
to shout your name, oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. sings your story at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out Lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise Yahweh Yahweh Messiah, 
has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seized the dawn, shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken from my regard
You know, Father, that song, the wording in the song speaks totally of the, the shalom that we can have in you. When it's well with our souls, that's when we can be in that shalom that comes from you. Father, we just thank you for this time that you've given us, this time of, of worship. I just praise you in the name of Yeshua. Father, we just thank you in the name of Yeshua. It's time to, to break up into our prayer groups. Um, if you see anybody new, please uh, gather them into your prayer group and be a part of uh, that for, with them. So go ahead.
Turn with me in your Bibles today to, <clears throat> excuse me, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 10. Romans 11, 1 through 10. It says, I asked then, has, has Yahweh rejected his people? Absolutely not. I, I'm too, I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Yahweh has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How, how he pleads with, with Yahweh against Israel? Master, they, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am, I am the only one left, and they are trying to, to take my life. But what was Yahweh's reply to him? I have left 7,000 men for myself who have not bowed down to, to Baal. In the same way, then, there, there is also the present time a remnant chosen by grace. Now, if by grace, then, then it is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. What then? Israel did, did not find what it was, it was looking for, but the elect did, did find it. The rest were, were hardened, as it is written. Yahweh gave them a, a spirit of insensitivity, eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear to this day. And David says, let their feasting become a snare and a trap, a pitfall and a retribution uh, to them. Let their eyes be darkened to the, so that the, they cannot see and their backs be bent continually. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the time that you've given us. And I just pray, Father, that, to, um, that you just open our eyes to what's being said here in the name of Yeshua. Amen. We actually were supposed to do this like three weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, we didn't, of course. And there was, there was a, an event with the eclipse that was part of that too. But, um, but you know, I think it's perfect timing. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, the time that we got to spend last week listen to, listening about Larissa's trip uh, on her mission trip. And I, I asked her a question, and I didn't say anything afterwards. I said it to her today. And I said, um, you know, I told her that she, she did a really good talk, okay? But at the end, when I asked her, did you see any salvations? She stopped short, because that was one of the things that I had talked to her about, is come back and talk about salvation. She made a statement that I really love, and that was that I asked about that. I asked, I asked Yahweh about that, and he told me that I was to show it through love, the salvation. And I thought, well, that was a good answer. <laughs> yeah, it, was really, it was really a good answer. And so I, I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to embarrass her by uh, talking in front of everybody, but it was wonderful, wonderful time. Thank you so much for sharing with us. So, so as we look at this, uh, this passage in Romans chapter 11, the first 10 verses, uh, we, can actually, we can actually see some things that I want to be talking about. We, can, we actually, it makes it look like there may have been a transition, and I want to go back and take a look at what I mean by that and where we were at. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. And, and for me, to be honest with you, this is, kind of, this is kind of huge, and I think that we really need to get it. In Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, I call it a prophecy if you will, that, that most of us have missed. And it goes like this. Now, if you will listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although all the earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. That's prophecy, because that never happened. And I don't think that he's changed his mind about anything. According to what Scripture said, he doesn't. So when we look at this, he's still going to make, a, you know, a, a nation of priests and, and a holy nation unto him. 
That's still for us for, for it to take place. Now, I know that this is a crazy place to say this is prophecy. Who found prophecy in, in Exodus, right? Well, the whole book is actually prophetic. As Yahweh began to open his plan, he would go through Moses, and Moses would take it back to the people. That makes it prophetic, right? Isn't that what happened in all the prophecies? So we can look at this and, and, and see that there may have been some kind of transition to us because we didn't get it. But in reality, he still plans on carrying out this, 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 this message, this, this uh, putting together his, his nation, if you will. We saw that, that, that Yahweh had planned this in, in, the, in, the, in the beginning and that, that Israel was supposed to be that holy nation, but we also saw that the whole, the whole nation, or most of the nation uh, of Israel, had rejected him out of unbelief. They had pulled away. Remember at, at Mount Sinai, he spoke to him the words, the Ten Commands. What did they do? It says that they pulled back. They pulled away. I believe that, that, that his, when he spoke those... What, when you speak, put your hand in front of your mouth and speak. I don't care if it's noisy. Go ahead and do it. Speak with your hand in front of your mouth. What do you feel coming out of your mouth? Breath. breath. I believe that as he spoke those words, it was his breath that they were to receive. Amen. By the way, that word breath, in both the Greek and the Hebrew, Hebrew, there you go, Hebrew, um, actually means breath or wind, right? And it, is, it, 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 it means the Ruach, and Ruach means the same thing, his breath or his wind, his spirit, right? So, I, you know, people say that there's no spirit stuff in the, in the, in the Bible, that's below, I mean, in the Old Testament, that's baloney. He, throughout history, had tried to draw his people in so that they would receive his breath. He, he also put his spirit on people to do certain things, like be king, and so forth. He also had people prophesy by his ruach. Here's the problem that, we, that exists, I believe. I believe that we read through this stuff and don't understand it. And so it leads us into a wrong direction. Even in, as, as we read in Romans chapter 11, he said that, that they, he gave them a spirit of insensitivity or of what? They couldn't understand, they couldn't see, and they couldn't hear what he was really trying to say because of their unbelief. Unbelief can lead us to those places of the, that we should not be in. Do you understand? If we don't believe, we're not seeing things correctly. Our belief in him will give us the difference between seeing, because that was part of what, the, what the, was prophesied about the comforter, the paraclete that would come. He would what? He would show you all things. He would remind you of everything that I have told you. Do you see that? So when we look at this, he's going, do you think that, he, that, that, that Yeshua only said that to them because he only wanted them to know the New Testament? Or do you think that the New Testament is a comprised of all this Old Testament stuff and that he wanted to know when Yeshua said, he, he said, I'm going to send somebody that will teach you, I'm going to send somebody that will show you, do you think that he was talking about his whole word? Why is there a wake-up call, all of a sudden a wake-up call on Sabbaths, on, on festivals, and all, all this stuff going on around the world? Is it because he's waking up his people? I believe it is. And it's true that we've slumbered too long. We're in, the, we're in the last moments of, of history as we know it. And most of it, we've been in slumber. Amen? Yes. 
For me, that's scary. Because it's like, it's like playing catch-up ball. Now, I know that he's got his hands on this, and he's going to get us where he needs us to be, right? When it's time. But to me, I'm thinking, how much time of my life did I waste by not knowing, by not believing? Even today, do we really believe that he can do the things he says he can do? For instance, I've talked about it earlier, our nation. Do we really believe that Yahweh can correct this stuff? Yeah. He says he's going to. And here's the thing. He, sa he says he's going to for a long, long time. Thousands of years. But he says that he's going to bring this, he's going to bring a nation to himself that are going to be a holy nation and a nation of holy priests unto him. We actually see this, I believe, is out of the life of the people that, that were directed throughout their life to do certain things and go certain places. For instance, let's look at Genesis chapter 12. You just thought you were going to be in Romans. Let's look at Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1, it says, Yahweh said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and, and, um, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. What we see is that, that Yahweh said, mark that word, said to Abraham. Now, this is interesting because, because it, it really begins to show us and draw us into something here. The, the word said in the Hebrew is, is amar. And you know what that word means? It, means? it means to answer, to appoint, to command. And you might say, so what? But the idea of this word meaning to answer is kind of interesting because if you look at the verses prior to this, this one verse in, in, in chapter 12, the first verse, in chapter 12, and go to, Gen to go to Genesis chapter 11, and let's take a look at verses 30 and 31. It says, Sarah was, was un unable to conceive. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Sarah was, was unable to conceive and, and did, did not have a child. Tira uh, took his son Abram, his, his grandson Lot, Aaron's son, and he, Aaron's son, excuse me, and his daughter, daughter-in-law, Sari, his, his uh, son Abram's wife, and they set out together from Ur to the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to, to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and, said in, and, and settled in Haran. In some sense, Abram's whole family knew that they were to leave Ur and go to Canaan. But they stopped short. Now, I, I want you to see this because it kind of shows us a little bit more about Abram's character. Because I believe that Aaron, or Abram actually at that point said, wait a minute. I thought Yahweh told us to go to, to Canaan. And he began to inquire of Yahweh. And that's why that word is used there in, in chapter 12, verse 1. And Yahweh said to Abram, it means, and Yahweh answered Abram. Which would have meant, if that's the case, which would have meant that Abram was inquiring of Yahweh what he was to do next because they stopped short. Can you imagine that? Now, you've got you to gotta look at it because that means that Abram was pretty determined to do what Yahweh wanted him to do. Wouldn't you say? Because you know how hard it is to, for, for them to leave their family and go on and do something else? In Hebrew life, the family was everything, right? And, and you don't just leave your family and pick up and go somewhere else unless there's something st that's strong uh, leading you to do that, for instance, Yahweh. 
Now let's go back, and I want to take this a little bit further. Let's go back and go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Verse 2. Brothers and, and, and fathers, he said, listen to, to the, the Elohim of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he settled in, in Haran and said to him, get out of your country and, and away from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. Stephen is given this message. He's, he's about to be stoned. Okay, he's about to die. And, and so Stephen, who, who's about to get stoned for, for his testimony of Yeshua, told the high priest and, and that Yahweh appeared to Abram. And so in the Greek, the, the, this, this is a specific word. This word appeared in the Greek. It's not a slip of the tongue that took place. This word is carefully selected because it's not the only one word that could have been used. The word in the Greek is a, is a tongue, up, up tenabai, okay? And it's so selective that Stephen could, could have only meant one thing, and that is that Yahweh met with Abram. And Yahweh, in some sense, uh, in some sense, Abram saw Yahweh, or and I'm going to talk about this in a second. The word used there has been, re, uh, has been replaced with, with other words, or if it had been replaced with other words, uh, it, would, it, it would have been different. But it, this particular word means to gaze upon with eyes wide open. It's where we get our word, optometrist. And the, this word of optometrist, I, I know you know what it is, but you've got to hear this definition. The word optometrist means a doctor who examines the eyes to apply corrective measures so people can see. So in some way, Yahweh, and I believe it was through the angel of the Lord, that, because the majority of the theologians believe that that was a pre-incarnate Messiah, or Yeshua. And so I believe that, that probably Abram, uh, Yahweh, through this, the spirit of angel, would have been Yeshua, appeared to Abram and answered Abram's inquiry of what to do next. We see this all through Scripture when Abram met with Melchizedek. Also with the covenant Yahweh made with Abram, so it is also the angel of the Lord, which, which most scholars believe, like I said, is the pre incarnate Messiah, the same that met with Moses and, and was in the cloud at the sea um, as, as, he was, as he was holding back uh, the Pharaoh and his army as the waters were being parted. So why did I go so far in this ex explanation? Because this next section of scripture that I'm talking about asks a very specific question that we're going to discuss and we have to know the facts of what Yahweh is doing. And that's why I read 11, uh, Romans 11, 1 through 10. So let's go back there. So the question was, has Yahweh reject, rejected his people? Now some say, yes, he has. Okay? Some say, yes, he has. And some say, only temporarily. And others say, he replaced them with Gentiles. Okay? Those are the theologies that are out there. In verse 1, Paul poses this question, what, did Yahweh reject his people? And Paul says, in, to answer this, uh, he, he says, absolutely not. Now, if you notice, he asked the question, did he replace? He didn't say, should he have replaced? 
Because the truth is, as I look at all this thing, I cannot, for the life of me, other than his love, figure out why, why we weren't replaced. Right? Did you get that? I can't figure it out other than that it's that love thing that he has for his people and his bride. I love Paul's teachings. It, the reason I love Paul's teaching is Paul, listen to me, Paul took, when, you know when the scales dropped off his eyes and he could see? Paul took the scrolls and took off for three years. You know why? Because he had to figure out what this Yeshua had to do with that scroll. He had to figure that out. It took him three years he was gone. And in that three years, Yahweh or Yeshua began to, to show him how it fit Torah. Do you remember the, the people that were on the road to, to Aramaeus? It says that he opened their eyes and he showed them where Scripture was talking about him. Now, understand me, they did not have the New Testament at that time. So he had to open the Old Testament scriptures and begin to point out where the scriptures talked about him. Can you imagine being with Yeshua at that time as he began to lay that out and begin to open their eyes to where they could see it? It was a wow moment, I'm pretty sure. It was one of those things where we're going, let's stop walking. I want to just sit. I want to just listen. I want you to show me more. I don't want to leave. I want some kind of download where I, I not only want you to tell me, I want you to cause me to remember. I want it so deep in me that if I'm cut, it comes out. Can you imagine being there and listening to him? And then think about the words that you said to him before. Are you the only one that hasn't heard? They just killed what we thought was Messiah. And then have him open your eyes. Go on. I'm believing my eyes and I'm not believing what you're putting into my heart. Part of what Paul begins to teach actually goes back to Jeremiah chapter 33. Go with me, please. We want to look at verses 24 through 26. 33 verses 24 through 26. Make sure I'm in the right chapter here. Jeremiah 33, 24 through 20, to, uh, 26. It says, have you not noticed what, what these people have said? They say that, the, that Yahweh has rejected two families he has chosen. My people are treated with contempt and no longer regarded as a nation among them. This is what Yahweh says. If, if, I, do, if I do not keep my covenant with the day and, the, the, and with the night, and fail to establish the fixed order of, of heaven and earth, 
then I might also reject the, the seed of Jacob and the seed of, of, of uh, servant David. Not, not taking from, from his descendants rulers over the, over the descendants of Abram and Isaac and, and Jacob. Instead, I will restore their, their fortunes and have a compassion on them. Now, this is about the, the, the restoration of Israel. But listen to what he says. He says, if I fail... Yahweh saying this, if I fail to keep my covenant between the night, the day and the night to where they don't come at regular times, then I might not have somebody on the throne of, of Jacob. And he said, I, I might not have somebody, somebody as a high priest um, it, with, with, from, from uh, uh, Levi. Excuse me. Thank you. I was getting ahead of myself. Do you understand what this means? He's talking about if he breaks the covenant. He's not saying if you break the covenant. He's saying if I break the covenant and I quit causing the day to come around at its regular time and the night come around at its regular time, then I'll blow it off, right? Just as sure as there's day and night, I'm going to keep my covenant. Right. And the covenant was that he would have what somebody sent on the throne from David or Jesse, the line of David, which would have been what, Judah, right? And he won't have anybody uh, that is a, is a priest under Levi. Now this is interesting because if you remember, we discussed this three weeks ago too, if you look at Yeshua's line between his mother and father, he has within his line both Judah and Levi. Now, who do you think that he's talking about here? He's talking about putting Yeshua in, in, in his, in the, on the throne and also as the high priest. Now, let me tell you something. Leave, the, the, the only reason that they call him the Melchizedek priest is because it involved both the king and a priest combined into the same person. This is about a man, that, not a man, natural man. This is about Yeshua. And what he's doing is he's putting all of us as not only his nation, but he's put all of us as his priests under him. Ah, wait a minute. But he's also putting us under him because we're going to roll with him. So he's also putting us within the line of what? Judah. Oh my goodness. Tink. Light comes on, right? Because we carry both inheritances because of Him. I, I'm excited. How about you? Scary to some of you? No. Remember who keeps the covenant. He does. That was the whole covenant between, between him and Abram that they went through. Now it's interesting because in Jeremiah 33, 17, he says this, it says, for this is what Yahweh says, David will never fail to have a man sitting on the throne of the house of David. The Levitical priest will never ha fail to have a man always set, always uh, a man set before me to offer burnt offerings and, and grain offerings and, and so forth and so on. The word man in the Hebrew, it could have used Adam, which would be mankind, right? But it used Ish, which talks about an individual man. It talks about an individual man. Who could that be? Yeshua. Amen? Wow. You see, he's answered everything that we need to know. But what we needed and what we still need is the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help us understand it. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there's other parts of Scripture 
as, as we go through this that we're going to be needed to look at. It is this passage that I'm talking about that we see that Yeshua would be the branch of righteousness. Now, the, the word branch is Natsar in, 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 uh, in, in Hebrew from Jesse or from David. But, what, but the Levite priest also, is, we find out he's got the line of, the, uh, of, of, of Levite too. For a man in Hebrew is specific. Scripture could not have used Adam because that would be mankind to be this specific. It had to use the word ish. Ish refers to a man as an individual man. And as we discussed two weeks ago, or three weeks ago now, uh, it directs us to Yeshua and his lineage. But if we look at, 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 at Jeremiah 33, 20 through 22, it says, this is what Yahweh um, says. If you can break my covenant with, with the day and my covenant with the night, so, so that the day and the night uh, cease to come at their regular times, then also my covenant with, with my servant David may be broken so, so that they will not have a son reigning on the throne and the Levitical priests will, will not be my ministers. Uh, the hosts of heaven cannot be counted. The, the, the sand of the sea cannot be measured. So, so too, I will make the descendants of my servant David and the Levites who minister to me innumerable. Wasn't that what Abraham received as the covenant from Yahweh? Said the same thing, didn't he? Said that in Genesis actually 22 verses 17 through 18. And he says, the, the, the interesting thing, he says, if you break my covenant, I might, or I could, or I may. He did not say he would. But continues down further and says, if I break the covenant, then I will. So the question is, does the New Testament line up with this? Okay? Because this is the proof in the pudding, right? Everybody says that the New Testament has flaws in it. Okay. I decided to put that out there as a disclaimer, right? Galatians chapter 3. Okay, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He, he does not say, uh, and to seeds, as through, through referring to many, but as referring to one and your seed who is Messiah. Okay, so that goes right directly back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, where he uses the same singular form in the Hebrew, his seed, singular. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Messiah and put on Messiah like a garment, there is no Jew or Greek or slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Messiah, Yeshua. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. So apparently the New Testament does line up with that other stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's 
Go back to Romans chapter 11. That's how long it took me to get to verse 1. In verse 2, Paul answers the question. Has Yahweh rejected Israel? And his answer is absolutely not. not. And he says that, that he is an Israelite and a, and a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. <clears throat> Paul quotes the Elisha. Turn with me in, in first King, to 1 Kings chapter 19. How many of you like this stuff? It's almost impossible to say that he's, re- he's forsaken us when he's given us so much, right? Okay, 1 Kings chapter uh, 10, or chapter 19, verse 10. He replied, I have been very zealous to Yahweh, Elohim of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword and I alone am am left and they are looking for me to take my life. There's some troubling stuff there. But let's not pick on Elijah because we do it too. Listen to the eyes in this. I alone am left. I have been zealous. What's going on with you? I've been zealous for you all these years. And I alone am left to suffer. (laughs) Sound familiar? Anybody? Apparently, Elijah had some questions about, it, about this whole thing, too, and, it, and made some of the assumptions that Yahweh was doing, was, was what Yahweh was not doing, actually. And I believe that, that we all feel like this from time to time, and the passage is good, uh, is a good one to turn to the next time we start saying I stuff. I alone we left. How come, how come I alone have to bear the burdens of Have you ever wondered if, 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 if he took his, his hand off you just for a second, what it would feel like? Probably be crushing. That's what Yeshua felt like when he was on that execution stake. And he had taken on the sins of the world. Paul points out in Romans 11.4 that, that Yahweh's answer to, to Elisha is found in 1 Kings uh, 19, verse 18. Let's turn there. But I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every, every knee that, that has not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Paul goes on to say that there's not only others, but he teaches about a remnant that that has been chosen by grace, and he explains that it had to be by grace because it was by works, they would not be saved. Really. Is what he said. It is those that are the remnant is those that have believed what he said. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 29.
Let's look at verse 4. It says, uh, yet to, to this day, Yahweh has, has not given you a mind to understand, eyes to see, or ears to hear. So Moses is telling the, Israel, uh, uh, the people in Israel that, that even up to this time, Yahweh has not given them a mind to understand and eyes to see. Even though they, they had seen all these miracles, they had failed to believe. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been a believer for quite a while? Okay, how many have seen miracles? Okay. How many have run into the struggle saying, where are you? What's, what's going on with you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're perfect examples of what he's talking about. Right? Is that that you know what we come into this place where we struggle in our belief in believing him and it, what it does is when we start into that road it begins to bring the, the blinders back down and you know what I'm, I know that, that, that the Ruach is there because the Ruach reminds me no don't do the pity party thing right Because if you start that and you stay in that, then you're going to be cut off from me and from what I'm saying. See, it goes back to this. There are actually three, three aspects to our salvation that Scripture talks about. One of them is that we were saved. The second one is that we are being saved. And the third one is that we will be saved when he returns. Amen? So when I use the term salvation, I'm actually talking about all three aspects. They sought after their salvation by works, not by faith. And Yahweh wants us to rely on him for our salvation because the works of our hands are as filthy rags. And they'll never bring us into righteousness. He didn't say not to work. He didn't say not to do good works because we're saved onto good works, right? That means we got saved so we could do good works. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to be believing the whole time, saying, oh, my hands are going to take care of it now. Although we do that sometimes. Say, he shows us something and says, okay, I got it. I, got, I know where you're going. And we take off and we think we can go do it without him. Don't do it. leaves marks. You can, you can talk to me, I know. Okay. Any questions, answers, comments? So um, a few Sundays ago, you asked us what tribe we are. Sunday? So our, our Saturday, Sabbath, whatever, sorry. I wanted to make sure I wasn't here on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I thought maybe I'd fall back it. in my old ways, you know. No. <laughs> you asked us what tribe we were. So the answer should be we're, tri we're of the tribe of Judah and Levi because we're in Yeshua. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, that would be our, part of who okay. we are. Going back to what you said about... Um, when Yeshua was bringing the people to, trying to draw the Israelites to him so that he could get the relationship with them, get them close enough with the breathing and everything. And every time I read that part in here, I just get the, and all the other the responses that they have, I just get this sense that they just didn't value him right from the beginning. And I'm not quite sure why that is the case, if it's from their experience in Egypt or if it's just human that they just really didn't see the value in making the effort or uh, responding to him. I think that it's, it, yes, it's probably above, uh, all the above. They, they, they did the same thing in Egypt. I mean, it was, uh, they, they, they saw Yahweh deliver them from all these uh, 
gods, if you will. Uh, and they still, when they get out, they still did the same thing when they got out of the wilderness. And so, I, I, you know, the thing is, is I think that, it, that our fallen flesh has trained our, our flesh so much that we tend to fall into that when we don't see it within a, what we think is a reasonable amount of time. We've got to remember that Yahweh doesn't work on our time. He works on his own time. He knows when everything's going to happen. It's one of the things that Paul brings up, and I didn't talk about it because it, it was getting late, but he said that those he foreknew, you know, uh, and to be honest with you, when you translate that, it actually means that because he's present, um, he's omnipresent, so he's present in the past, he's present in the, in the now, and he's present in the future. And so how could he not know who he foreknew. You see what I mean? So he knows the outcomes of things. That doesn't mean that he doesn't still offer because, you know, he offers freely to everyone, it says. But he, he knows what the outcomes are going to be. You see what I mean? So when you look at this, when you look at this whole thing, he knew that the, after the fall that this was going to be a problem with people. You know, so that's why he made all these plans. Now, the interesting thing is, he made these plans before we even existed, before mankind even existed. He knew what was going to happen, and he knew what he would have to take his people through to redeem them. But he did it anyway. You are being protected by God's power through faith for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes, though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You love him, though you have not seen him, and though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. Go back to your question real quick here. I don't know how quick it's going to be, but I, I'll just say that. Keep from scaring everybody. Anyway, Boaz is a prime example. Boaz married a Moabite woman. Now, the Moabite were evil and bad people because they are actually the ones that, that, uh, that had called uh, Balaam to come in and and tried to put a curse on, on Israel and all this. And so, but, Mo, but Boaz went ahead and married her, and um, she, became, even, she became part of Judah under, because she had married um, into, into Boaz, you know, Boaz's line. So when we, whatever line, we're marrying into him, you know, or we're adopted or brought in. So whatever line Yeshua has, we do too. Okay, now we're finding out that Yeshua pretty much has, has them all, you know. So how that sorts out, I'm going to leave it up to him. Okay, because I'm pretty sure he's got a plan. So anyway, as we look at that, then our line, our lineage, would be that of his. It would come through him. And it's a matter of faith. I, I love you, brother, with your scripture there. And in just that scripture, faith was mentioned three times. It's through faith. Our protection's through faith. Our lineage is through faith. It, it, it's all about faith. That's, and, and none of us have perfect faith. It's one of my favorite verses. I pray it all the time. Even when, in when my strongest faith moment, uh, I'll, I'll pray for that. I say, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Because I always lack some faith, or, or I would be like Yeshua if I didn't. That was what Yeshua, how he, why he was perfect, because of his faith in Yahweh that he never doubted him ever. So he was perfect. It's all about faith. Anyone else? I was just going to say that I'm so glad that you're sharing this because... I look at most of us, and myself included, and it's there. If I fully understood how 
how Yahweh sees me and my position, there would be no fear in serving him. There would be no, well, send somebody else. There would be, what can I do? Right. And yeah. I'm getting there, and, you know, I just praise, the, praise Yahweh for putting this uh, passion in your heart to share this. Anyone else? Okay. Well, oh, so we'll do. One of the things that we have to remember is what James says and what Jesus says in the book of James. It's talking about Abraham in James chapter 2. But first it says, and I'm just going to start with verse 12. So speak and so do as those who shall be judged by the law of liberty. And verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac his son upon the altar? See how faith wrought by his works and by works was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. And Jesus said that we are to walk in the straight and narrow way and that we are to abide in his commandments. That he said, I have abided in my Father's commandments. I do them, and I have abided in my Father's love. If you abide in my commandments, and if you abide in my love, you shall no longer be called servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing, but you shall be called friends for friends know what their friend is doing. And Abraham was a friend of God. Shall we not be like Abraham, our father? Okay, anyone else? Okay, maybe some announcements now. If you'll go to the back in the foyer, I'm not telling anybody to do this now, okay. <laughs> you'll find a sheet of pepper, paper that looks like this, and it has the, the, the final, uh, the fall festivals on them, okay? And it kind of shows what we're going to be doing, okay? Um, there's one of them, for instance, and I, I, I don't know if they've talked to you yet. Okay, there's one of them, it's going to be at Sukkot. And it's going to be the final day. We're actually going to ha act out the return of Messiah, um, and we're going to start off by we're going to start it off by Oneg, but we're going to have a, 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 a at the end of Oneg we're going to have a a, a marriage a wedding procession uh, coming down the hallways, and we'll all gather in here and begin to worship and praise. Uh, kids are involved in in a skit and so forth. So. Um, so it's going to be kind of fun. So you want to be here for that. So anyway, well, you want to be here for all of them. That's good. Good. If, if we're going to do this, we got to be here for them. Uh, anyway, uh, so th remember that. Also, there's a Bible's, uh, women's Bible study that starts um, September 6th here. This Wednesday. It, this Wednesday. And it's, uh, it's a D. Smith is teaching it. And it's a study of Psalm 2. Uh, is that chapter two? Or? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, the study materials are free. Um, she's got them. Uh, you can also, you can sign up in the foyer um, and get a notebook if you want to. We also need, still need kitchen help. Anybody like to become part of the kitchen help and, and, uh, and work in, in helping serve others? Um, see uh, Jude. Yeah. Help needed. Uh, we need help in, in the production booth. If, if you're interested, please contact uh, Rose Treasure. And somebody put in there, see me. Oh, I got volunteer for yet another one. <laughs> okay, uh, also, we're still got the gospel rocks going on. In fact, I saw one of the little ones up here for the, the blessing uh, of the children, found one. <laughs> and, and took it back. So, with him. So yeah, it's um, 
So still be looking for rock for rocks. Got cool scriptures on them and stuff like that. And the idea is to reach out to others. Did I miss any announcements? Oh, prayer meeting. Yeah, excuse me. It's right up on top. Prayer meeting. This is 6 o'clock here on Thursday nights. The whole prayer thing, prayer is absolutely essential. A family that prays together stays together. God is exhorting this house to pray. And I keep hearing about just a small nucleus. So this is for the guys. This is an exhortation for the guys. The women are meeting faithfully. There's a small nucleus of women, and I'm so thankful f- that they're moved to pray. So I just want to, I just want to kind of challenge the guys. When are we going to start praying, boys? Boys. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many of you want to be blessed? <laughs> you stand up. And you always spoke to Moses. Tell Aaron and his sons how you were to bless the Israelites. Say to them, may Yahweh bless you and protect you. May Yahweh make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And may Yahweh look with favor on you and give you shalom. In this way, they will pronounce my name over the Israelites, and I will bless them. You may be seated for the, for the bracha. I, I um, am going to do it in English. The reason I do that is because when I speak Hebrew, it's deep southern Hebrew. <laughs> you need a translator to understand what I'm saying. <laughs>